and Luke. We'll be actually in Matthew chapter 1 just a little bit, and then we're going to, uh, right after that, we'll pray, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 38. So be ready for that, okay? A little bit of a switch here. And I'm looking forward to getting started, getting started. It's tough to get into this series that we're in because there's so much preliminary material. And so you really had a good time if you haven't been with us the last several weeks or if you're just starting to come or beginning a series on the Synoptic Gospels, looking at uh, the similarities and differences in the Gospel accounts that help us to understand, uh, first of all, uh, how perfect God's Word is. We really have kind of laid the groundwork for that. But to help us to understand, uh, it's not minutia, but some things that oftentimes are brought to the forefront or to your attention by looking at how the Scripture says things differently in places and times. So, are you in Matthew chapter chapter 1? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to read the first, uh, the first two verses and right into the, the halfway through verse 3. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Tamar. And that's where we'll stop and we'll pray. Father, thank you this morning for how specifically your word lays out truth. And God, I pray that the truth that we learn today would just sink into our hearts. That we would have eyes to see, hearts to listen, ears to hear. And that we would know you more as a result, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I had the opportunity to witness to somebody. One of the things that I told them is something that just seems to become uh, more and more something that I'm convinced of. And that is this, I personally have no use for religion. I don't know about you, but to me, religion is just... It's, it really is true what people that are anti-religion say about it. What are some things they say about it? Well, I've heard this. Religion is just a way to control people. And you know, I found that to be very true about religion. Oftentimes, it's a means for controlling people. Uh, I've heard people say religion is all about power and money. I mean, I'm going to tell you something, in the highest of places, I've found that to be true, particularly in organized religion. Now, you know, you, you like being clever about the same thing, but sometimes it's not clever when you've heard it a hundred times. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I don't like organized religion? I remember the first time I heard my wife tell us, well, no problem, we're very disorganized in our religion. And, so, <laughs> and actually, Melissa's like the very wrong person to say that she's disorganized, but you come follow me around a little bit and you'll see I'm very disorganized. But I'm not religious. And I, uh, I just reject the idea of, of religion. Religion is really, I, I heard it years ago put this way, and I think it's accurate enough that it, it probably stands for a simple definition, that religion is man's attempt to get to God. This is what I do so that God will accept me. And do you know something? You remember what they said when, when Sputnik went into outer space? What did they say? I don't see God. That was Sputnik, right? The Russians? No. no. What, which one was it? The first the first cosmonaut. Who was he? No. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Joel knows. That guy Joel knows. But the first thing he did when he went into outer space was to say, I don't see God. I think about, um, you know, there, our, our government seems like we're going after space travel, and I think it's interesting. I, I'm fine with that. I, I don't want to get political about anything here today. And, I, and it's surprising to me that space travel would be politicized. But uh, we're going to try to go to Mars. You know what they're going to see when they get to Mars? They're going to see stuff they've never seen before. <laughs> right? Since they've never been to Mars. I think, I think it's possible. I think they'll do it. I think they'll land on Mars. When they get there, they'll see something that they've never seen before. But you know something they will not see when they get to Mars? They will not see God. Because God is greater than the heavens. The earth is His throne and the heavens are His footstool. And God is supersedes all that. He's beyond all that. You'll never be able to go and say, well, there's, there's God. We found Him. And that's where He's confined to because God's not confined to anywhere. Religion confines God. And uh, so one of the things that I love about the Bible is that 
it's not a religious book, but you know, religions have religious books. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't mean to sound like I'm bashing here this morning, but I've read many uh, religions, religious books, and found them to be um, frivolous, and uh, boring's not a nice word to use, is it? Well, you think I'm boring, so I guess it's not such a terrible <laughs> word, right? Uh, but I found it to, oftentimes, religious books are boring. I've read the Book of Mormon. I'm not going to say I've read every single word of it, but I've, I have devoted time many years ago to trying very hard to read the Book of Mormon so I could say I'd read the Book of Mormon. And the first thing that struck me in reading the Book of Mormon is, one, the plagiarization. A lot of it's just plagiarized right out of the Bible, just copied word for word. Uh, but the other thing that got me about the Book of Mormon is just all the fanciful people and places. They just expect you to, to just buy this history that there's no other record of outside of the Book of Mormon. You know, these, the angel Moroni, moron, whatever. Uh, the angel, you know, he wrote in, in, in these places that take Middle Eastern type of language and heritage and put them into like Western United States. And anybody that's just into truth and want to say, does that actually exist anywhere, has to say, no, that's all made up. It's not historic fact. It's like alternative fact. It's sort of like, uh, you know, Star Wars. And I'm sorry, you Star Wars people, but you know Star Wars is not real, right? So it, was, it was made up, right? So I see some shocked faces here today. And I, don't mean to be, I don't mean to be the guy that tells the children that there's no Santa Claus. I don't want to be that at all oh, here today. But uh, Star Wars, is, it's fiction, okay? It's just for fun. Okay? It's not real. But there's religion that makes up things like that. It makes up heritage and people and encounters with, quote, gods and so forth. Um, I, I've spent a good bit of time reading the Hadiths. Anybody ever read the Hadiths? I don't recommend it unless you want to just be uh, shocked and grossed out. But you know, talk about a perverted, just a, just a perverse book. It's all about justifying perverted sexual things. I mean, really, the Hadiths is almost everything is about fornication, and it's okay because of this, these, these type of things. Really, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I've read it. Don't judge me until you read it. Okay, it's, it's just fact. And that's religion. Religion is this, is this is what we believe, and this is our purpose, and here's our book. Friend, the Bible's not that way. The Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, God had Moses write the law, the things that God had given, given the history. And archaeology, geology corroborates what the Bible says. But people do as well. And I love it that the first the first verse in the New Testament of the Scripture begins with the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat... Well, we stopped there in our reading this morning. But I love it that Matthew begins with... I'm going to tell you who Jesus is, and I'm going to tell you who He actually is. That's cool. Lord, this is His lineage. These are the prophecies which He fulfills. Friend, it is no accident that God the Holy Spirit <clears throat> promised, and God promised Abraham it's going to be of your seed. And we don't have a messianic figure who, well, it doesn't fit all these things, but you know, He did miracles. No, He actually comes from the lineage of David. And so, uh, we don't have time to see it all today, but there are two genealogies in the New Testament, and they have some divergent material in them. I want to look at that. But first of all, I want to look at this Tamar thing. Because the truth of the matter is, religion never tells the bad things. Religion never tells the bad things. Try to find anywhere in Mormonism the actual record of Joseph Smith as he worked his way from the Northeast through Missouri and to Utah. Try to find anything that, that Mormonism says about the crimes which he committed. It's just deleted. It's just erased. Try to, try to find any facts about why he was in jail when the lynch mob came and took him and hung him. What were his crimes? It's not in Mormonism. No Mormon knows about Joseph Smith from a factual, historical, you know, extra-biblical standpoint. Not that it's biblical, but you understand what I mean, don't you? Why is that? Well, because 
The actual facts don't fit the narrative. I love it that the Bible tells us the good and the evil about people that God used. Hmm. One, because this is not a this is not a righteous person in his own in his own strength and ability. Let me just say that to you today. And I don't think I'm looking at a bunch of perfect people either. So I love it that God can take people who are sinners and by the justification of His Son Jesus can make them righteous. And He can do wonderful things with people that are sinners. But it's not because they're wonderful. It's because He is. And that's one of the things we see in the genealogies. In other words, Matthew is going to show us that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of David, that He is actually the King of the Jews, that He qualifies to be the King of the Jews. But some of the things that we find in Matthew's genealogy are not so pretty. Are you in Genesis chapter 38? No. Because you find Genesis 38, let's read some of what is being said. Because in verse 3, the Bible says, Judas begat Phares uh, and, and Zerah of Tamar. Phares and Zerah were, were uh, twins. And my Bible took me to Ezra for some reason. I marked Ezra. There we are, Genesis 38. I don't like it when I open my Bible and it doesn't say the right thing. I'm like, oh man, now what am I going to preach? Uh, let's go down in <clears throat> Genesis 38, <clears throat> if you will with me, please. And I want to just begin reading in verse 6. There's a lot of preliminary things. But the Bible says, Judah took a wife of Ur, his firstborn, um, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So, Judah is, of course, one of the sons of Jacob, right? Mm -hmm. And Jacob has a son whose name is Ur. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> that was terrible, wasn't it? Come on, man. Right. He'd be Ur. Anyway, his name was Ur. <laughs> that was really awful. I can't believe you people laughed at that. It was good. Some of you laughed. Some of you are just groaning and crying inside. Uh, anyway, so he has a son, Ur, and his son, Ur, has marries a wife, Tamar. And the Bible just simply says about Ur, here's, here's Ur's life story. Uh, verse 7, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. It's a pretty brief <laughs> synopsis. You know, you could put that on a tombstone, couldn't you? He was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so God killed him. Ur. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because... Uh, we look at oftentimes how God is so merciful in so many instances of different individuals. Like in Daniel right now, we've been in Daniel, we've been looking at Nebuchadnezzar. Mm. Man, God was merciful to Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't He? Seriously. He was very merciful. And then we look at Nebuchadnezzar's son, and Nebuchadnezzar's son lifts himself up in pride one night, and God says, that's it, you knew what Nebuchadnezzar knew, and you're gone. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and wham! It's over. And I find a great amount of comforting knowing that we have a God who is a righteous judge who knows the past, the present, and the future. And God knows when it's in the heart of a person to humble himself and to repent. And you know, it doesn't need to be said because we know the character of God that Ur was wicked, and Ur was so wicked he wasn't like, you know, he, made, he, you know, he had a, a bad couple of years and got away from the Lord. No, he was wicked and God said, you know what? There's nothing to work with here. And the Lord slew him. And that's Judah's, that's Judah's firstborn son. Now, if you read Leviticus, you would see the law for Levite marriage, for what we call leveret marriage. And the, because of the importance of the inheritance being passed from generation to generation, and not only the inheritance, but particularly with Judah, there is, a, there is a lineage that's being passed through Judah here, you see. This is the lineage of Jesus Christ. So, having a son... And being part of that heritage. I mean, think on this. Who is the good son in Jacob's house? <coughs> Help me. Who? Joseph was, right? Joseph's the good son. Joseph's not in the lineage of Christ. Judah is. And here we see in Genesis, you know, we know the promise that God made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And Judah's the son of Jacob. So this is kind of an important thing here. Judah's son Ur, the mistake, makes no, I can't stop saying. He marries a wife by the name of Tamar, and the Bible just said he was wicked, so God said, 
Now that's significant because had had uh, Ur not been wicked, he'd have been in the lineage of Jesus Christ. It's more than just he died. It's like you're cut off. Hmm. You're not part of this eternal promise that God has made that He's going to give a Redeemer and you're going to be part... I mean, being born the firstborn son of Judah was a big deal. Do you see this? Hmm. Now for Judah to have a son to pass on that heritage, for him to have a lineage, that's also important, isn't it? And that's where the story of Tamar gets really uh, interesting because Tamar was a Canaanite. She was just a... Uh, she was... She, she was... Um, she was, you know, not really part of the seed of promise or anything like that. And look at verse 8. Judah said unto Onan, go into thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. That was the Leverett Law. The younger brother had to take the wife and when they had a child, it was considered to be his brother's child. Judah said in or verse 9, Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Well, he's batting a thousand right here, Judah is, as far as his sons and, and their being uh, good men goes. Keeps going. In verse 11, then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah my son should be grown, for he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did, and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, Judah's wife died. Well, that's really sad, isn't it? He loses his daughter. He's lost two sons. Hmm. Judah's had a lot of tragedy, actually, in his family, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. The Bible says, And Judah was comforted, went up to his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adalumite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father in law goeth to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So Judah lied. When Shelah grew up, he was supposed to marry Tamar and Judah didn't keep his word. When Judah saw her, verse 15, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. They turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter in law. And she said, Wilt thou give me that thou what wilt thou give me that thou mayest come unto me? And he said, I'll send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge? Shall I send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy braces, bracelets, and thy staff that's in thine hand. And he gave it to her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. She arose and went away and laid her veil from her, laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the friend of, by the hand of his or kid by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. And he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There is no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I send this kid, thou hast not found her. Now here's where the story gets interesting. Is this interesting already? Crazy. Yeah, okay. Came to pass about three months after that he was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by a whoredom. Mm. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. There's a man with great integrity. Right? He's, he is really going to... Uh, boy, you know, my daughter-in-law has played the harlot. The Bible says, when she, verse 25, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man who these are, Am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray, who are these? The signet, the bracelets, and the staff. Hmm. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son, and he knew her no more. And the Bible says in verse 27, It came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. It came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. It came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee? Therefore his name was Phares. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zerah. Well, would you go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 3? The Bible says, Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Tamar. 993. That's page, yeah, page 993 in that Bible. Uh, so, you see the story here? Judah is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, and that's a great privilege. Genesis actually has a theme woven all the way through it 
from the time that we see Adam being created and Eve being born and Ad, um, Cain and Abel and Cain killing his brother Abel and Seth being born. This theme we see is a righteous godly line that desires to have God. To have a relationship with God and to have God's goodness. And then you have an ungodly line so which is the line of Cain. And there's always a, there are always two divergent lines until you come down to Noah where Noah's uh, the only person left that hasn't gotten together with from the line of Seth and the line of Cain and married and become wicked themselves. Mm. And you see Noah's sons and you see them diverge. You see a godly seed and an ungodly seed. And you have the sons of Jacob, 12 sons, that are going to be the nation of Israel. Jacob is going to be Israel. But one of his sons is going to be this, this lineage of this seed and that son is Judah. Now, there's a lot of things we could say about Judah just from the story that we know about him here, right? You know, Genesis 38 is right between, get this, this is going to blow your minds, it's right between Genesis 37 and 39. <laughs> wow. And Genesis 30, 37 begins the story of Joseph, and right in the middle of the story of Joseph is this little interlude. Chapter 39, we pick up with Joseph again. Right in the middle of the end of... Uh, or right in the middle is chapter 38, which is this story about Judah. Why do you suppose... Why do you suppose this story is interjected in Genesis chapter 30? It's, it's actually kind of interesting, isn't it? Because we're talking a couple thousand years from then till the birth of Christ. Well, first thing I want to say is that nothing is in the Scripture by accident. Nothing's in the Scripture by accident. I love it that the Bible accurately reports. You know, if you were a religious person writing Genesis 38, it would be, a righteous man, Judah, was born. And he lived so pure and innocent before God that God said unto him, Thy seed shall later be part of the Messianic line because of thy goodness before me. Or something like that. And what we find out is Judah had a godless son named Ur. And he was so wicked that God killed him. How does a kid get to be wicked? Well, watch Judah and his brethren interact with Joseph sometime. And they got it pretty naturally, actually, because when we begin reading in Genesis 37 about Jacob, what's the first thing you read? He loved Joseph more than all his other sons. That's messed up. You read about Jacob and his relationship with his wives, and you say, that's messed up. And yet in it, there's this beautiful story of how God can take messed up people. Now Judah made a statement when he found out that the, that the baby, that his daughter who had played the harlot had. Jacob, Judah made a statement. His statement was, she's been more righteous than I have. She's been more righteous than me. We don't really think of that as righteous, do we? Do you know there's something about about Tamar. You know what's special about Tamar? She wanted to be part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Imagine this Canaanite girl marrying a guy part of this weird family. I mean, you ever think about the Israelites? Jacob's children, and you, you just hear the stories about that. There's some real scandal. Do you remember when um, they murdered that whole group of people? Yeah, over Dinah. Do you remember uh, Jacob and Esau? Mm -hmm. How Jacob stole the birthright from his brother? And they got this... He wants this inheritance that rightfully should have been his brother's. And now, you remember Esau? How he just didn't seem to care about something? That was a big deal? Listen to me, my friend. There is something about the heart of God that is moved by someone who cares about his involvement in their lives. You know, oftentimes there's this lie that is that is put forth about God, and sometimes Christians, I think, are guilty and it's getting traction or getting further. And the lie is that God is this austere, angry God up in heaven who loves some people and doesn't love other people. And His choice of love is just so 
such a mishap or a happenstance that there's just no way, I mean, you just, you can't help it. You're not an Israelite and God doesn't love you, right? But you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. Isn't it fascinating that in the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the Son of God, born of a virgin, the miraculous birth, the Son of God, God. Was God's Son anything that involved any kind of sin? Jesus ever sinned? He ever do anything wicked? No, perfect Son of God. And we see this heritage that qualifies Him. And there's a story of Tamar right there in the middle of it. Right there in the middle. Go to Joshua, would you please? Go to Joshua. I want to look at something else as well. I know many of you have seen this before, but it's just such an important truth that it ought to have an overreaching effect into, into our lives. Joshua, and I believe it's chapter 2. Find here. Brother Will Rice preached this last Sunday. I thought, you rascal. You're meddling. Uh, he, he got into my message, but actually I'm really glad he did. Uh, look at verse 1 of, of chapter 2. If you weren't here last week for Brother Will's message, it was recorded and it'll be online on YouTube. And it'd be worth your while to hear it because of what he pointed out in Verse 1, the son of Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. And he pointed out those two words that are sandwiched together there, spying and secret. You know, every spy walks in and goes, hey, just so everybody knows, I'm a spy, right? Well, it's interesting, the Bible's not saying they were secret spies. In other words, they were, they were spying secretly. The Canaanites knew there were spies in the land. They, 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 they were looking for them. But Joshua sent the spies secretly. Because the last time that they had sent uh, one of every one of the twelve tribes, they'd had ten guys come back and say, ah, we can't do it, God can't do it. Yes. And only two guys, and Joshua being one of them, uh, that said, yes, this can happen. Yes, God can do this. And so Joshua doesn't tell the Israelites that he's sending spies. He secretly sends a spy, or sends spies, and they meet a woman. Uh, in verse uh, 2, it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. So Jericho, people from Jericho knew that they were spies, so they weren't so secret for them. Verse 3, The king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house, <coughs> for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men, hid them, and said, Thus, there came men unto me, but I wish not went out. They were. Now go down with me, <coughs> if you would please, to verse 10. This is Rahab speaking to the spies. She said, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites <coughs> that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Verse 11. As soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by your Lord, by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my Father's house and give me a true token. She, they told her to hang a scarlet thread outside of, uh, outside of her window on the wall and that if she did that, everyone that was in her house would be spared and that's what actually happened. Now go back with me to Matthew chapter 1, will you please? Verse 5, this is further down from, from Tamar. The Bible says at Matthew chapter 1, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. That's Rahab. And that actually would be how you would pronounce it. That would be a pretty good transliteration. Rahab. Rahab. Uh, and who is this woman? What kind of a woman is she? Well, she's a harlot. She's a prostitute. It's interesting about these two women that are right away mentioned. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very fascinating to me when you read Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat Judas. You don't have to say who their wives were, do you? But the Holy Spirit wants us to know. Wants us to know that a woman who valued being of the lineage of Jesus Christ a great deal more than her father-in-law did did what she had to do. 
to make sure that she got what was promised to her. A seed. You think, do you think she had a good functional relationship with her father-in-law who was her father's child? You think Tamar had just a, you know, just a wonderful life after that. Everything was just hunky-dory. I mean, once Judah said, you know what, she's been more righteous than I, you know what, I'm going to take care of her. No, he said, go home. What you did is what you did. Hey guys, don't be a distraction, okay? What you did is, I guess, right. Do you think Judah treated her well? No. no. But what did God know? God knew what her heart was. There's a woman in Jericho, and she's doing pretty much what people in Jericho do. That would be pretty representative of the culture of the day. And of course, she would have had a common house. That would have been a place where strangers would have gone and probably stayed. They went to her, and she said, the people in our country know what God did when He had you pass over the Red Sea on dry land. The people in our country know what happened to the kings of the Amalekites or the Amorites. And they're afraid. And what I'm telling you is, is that I know what God's going to do and I believe Him and I want to be spared. You know God did more than that for her. God saved her alive. She was the only survivor of Jericho, she and her family. And you'd think, man, God spared a prostitute. God's merciful. My friend, God's more than that. See, one of the things God is that you and I must be reminded about and the genealogies really bring us to is that God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't say, wow, pedigree. Descendant of Jacob. Wow, pedigree. Descendant of Abraham. God sees the heart of a woman like Tamar and says, you know, there's something about a heart that has a desire that pleases me. God sees a woman like Rahab who would, I mean, I've just never, the facts are the facts, and I've heard the facts presented, but I've never had anyone extol the virtue of Rahab. Do you know what's special about Rahab? She had a heart. She wanted to be part of God's plan and God's purpose. She wanted to be part of God's people. You know, God has never excluded anyone who wants to be part of His people. It's fascinating to me that as we see aberrations, and we'll finish up, we're really out of time this morning, as we see aberrations between the genealogies of Luke and Matthew, it's fascinating to me the things which are included, and they're no accident, my friend. They're no accident. Matthew and Luke didn't get together and read the document that Mark copied his cost. I'm joking about this. We preached about this a couple weeks ago. They didn't get together and find the source document for Mark and say, you know, what are some important things that we can include? No, my friend, the Holy Spirit of God says, I want the record to be shown. Do you realize that the first few verses of the New Testament tell us about a woman who played a harlot and another woman who was a harlot? And they tell us this is the pedigree of the people that God used to give us His Son. It really helps me to see the heart of God. You know, I'm afraid. I'm afraid there's more talk about love and acceptance mm -hmm. in the church than there actually is love and acceptance. You know, the more it's advertised, I think the less it actually exists. I don't know how many times I've seen that. Come as you are. We're, we, don't, we don't judge you. If advertising a church, which is negative about other churches, right? It's, it's saying we don't judge you, they do. right? But actually all that is is negative advertising. God give us churches that believe that God can save and God can change and God can use anyone. Because that's not as normal as it ought to be. Remember what James was telling the, the Hebrews, the, the Hebrew brethren? He so said, if one come into your assembly and he's got goodly raiment, goodly apparel, and you know, he looks this way and you say to him, sit thou here, and you say to someone else, he's in you know, vile raiment or not as nice, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. Are you not partial? Are you become judges in yourselves? One of the things that we find 
in the genealogies, right in the, in the generations of Jesus Christ, the first thing we see, my friend, is an impartial God. An impartial God. You hear this morning, you say, I wonder if, I wonder if I'm good enough. You know, from what I can see, everybody looks pretty good. Right? I mean, from what I can see, I can't see what God sees. I can't see the heart. From what I see, everybody looks pretty good. But you know, I think there's a lot of us that are here that are saying, you know, I wonder, I wonder if I'm good enough. You know, God loves that. God loves the heart of a person that says, you know, I want to be part of the body. I want to be part of God's purpose. I want to be part of God's plan. And God doesn't look and say, well, you know. See, that's men that do that. Hmm. And if you wrote the genealogies, you have to be honest and say, you wouldn't have had the idea of using Tamar. And she could argue and say, but I so badly want to be part of God's plan. And you'd say, hmm, thank you for your willingness. And you'd have found somebody better. I'm just telling you, I don't think you would have thought of putting Rahab in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, in God's eternal purpose, did He need Rahab? And there wasn't anybody? And Rahab said, you know what? I believe in God. And I fear God. And I want to be part of this plan of what God's doing. And you know... You and I, if we were interviewing, we'd say, well, really thank you for your willingness to be involved in this way, and we'll get back to you. We'll let you know. And God isn't like that at all. He's not a respecter of persons. He's not partial. He just sees a heart. I think Rahab was always a godly, <clears throat> righteous woman. I think Tamar was just this virtuous woman. who If she was that great, she'd have never married her in the first place. I don't know that actually. I'm just saying some things to be a little bit silly, but I think it's true that they weren't perfect. And God just takes imperfect people that have a heart to be used by Him. And He takes them where they're at and He takes them to places you'd never believe. And I don't know where you're at today. I mean, I know where you're at right now. But I don't know where you're coming from some more, some less than others. You'd say, Pastor, you know, I'm just not really like y'all. I'm just a little different than whatever. You know what? What do you like in God's eyes? What does God see in your heart? What does He know about you? There are all kinds of people that would probably have qualified if we were writing the genealogies, weren't there? But God actually used Tamar. And God actually used Rahab. And let me just tell you something. We're not looking for the lineage of Jesus Christ. God's just looking for hearts of believers that are sold on being part of His eternal purpose and plan. And God wants to use just regular people in a great way. I didn't say this this morning, but it's, it needs to be said, doesn't it, that God uses women... Is that incredible? You know, culture, worldly culture, demeans, abuses, and puts down women. At the same time, talking about how it lifts them up. But you know what God does? God uses them just the same as anybody, their people. Mm -hmm. just, it's just the same. And He makes them for a purpose. And if you look at Rahab's life and you just think, oh, Man, you think you think Rahab was treated well? Think, you think Rahab was treated well when she was in Jericho? Was she an equal? No. She was treated like trash. You think Tamar was treated well? She was treated like trash. But what did God think about them? You know, sometimes we fall into the pitfall of looking at ourselves and we try to figure out what other people look at us as. Don't we? Mm -hmm. you, you try to figure out what pastor thinks about you and I try to figure out about what you think about me. You know, none of that really matters because you are what God sees. You are what God knows. 
And that's important, isn't it? And that has two areas of application, doesn't it? You know, sometimes you're satisfied because you know you got me fooled. Pastor thinks I'm wonderful, and I do. That's true. I think you're wonderful. That shouldn't be good enough for you. What's God know? What's God see? Sometimes people, sometimes we are more concerned with having people think about us the way we want them to think. And we don't even ponder or consider at all what God thinks. I want to tell you what God thinks about Tamar. That mattered then and it matters today. What anyone else thought? What Judah, her. I mean, didn't Judah have a treasure for a daughter in law? Mm -hmm. He really did, didn't he? When you have a daughter in law that wants to be part of the family, that's special, isn't it? She wanted to be part of the family. She wanted to be part of that heritage. And that's special. And Judah didn't care at all about that. But God did. And Rahab, she wanted to be part of the family. And God saw that. God knew her heart. And He did incredible things. What's God doing with you? What's your attitude toward the family? You know, I fear sometimes Christians are more concerned about being accepted by people that are integrated into the world and its lifestyle and its way of thinking. And they really don't want to be part of the church family. Try this sometime. Pretend sometimes somebody asks me, tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. And see what you say about yourself first. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a great swordsman. What do you, how, how do you see yourself? How do you introduce yourself? You know the first thing that a believer who wants to be part of God's family ought to be? Well, you know, one of the first things I am is I'm a child of God. That ought to be a big deal in your life, shouldn't it? I'm part of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. I mean, if that's what God's all about, if, if Jesus is all about His church, isn't being part of the church a big deal? Shouldn't it be? And yet we're more interested in telling people other things a lot of times about ourselves or being seen other ways. And you know, the way you see yourself in that way, I'll tell you a lot about what God knows about you. What God sees about you. You know what Tamar would tell you? <clears throat> well, I married Judah's son. And so I'm part of a pretty important covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's that'd be Tamar. That was what mattered to her. Rahab. Well, you know something? I got a real interesting story because I came from a godless background. I was part of Jericho and the land of Canaan, and, and we were wicked. My family was wicked. Everybody around me was wicked. I was wicked. But I found out about the true and living God. And in His mercy, He spared me. I became His child. And man, I'm part of His plan now. And those are some special ladies, aren't they? In all the genealogies, those two ladies. There's a third one. The wife of Uriah. There's a third one there that's interesting as well. But all through the genealogies, those are the things that stand out to me because they help me to see the heart of God. And you know something? When I see the heart of God, I see something that's better than what I could have imagined. God's not this unloving, austere respecter of persons who's looking for people to measure up. He's a person who sees people as what they are. He's a, I'm sorry, He's a God who sees people as what they are. And He knows how that He can bring them to a place where they measure up through the sacrifice of His perfect Son. Jesus. Jesus is the demonstration of God's impartial love to all men. Jesus told Nicodemus when he came to him by night this. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's one of the kindest statements that could ever be made. Because so many times people think that there are things they can do to get into God's kingdom, to God's heaven, to find God. And Jesus just frankly said, you, you can only do it by being born again. And he said, the way to get born again, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he said, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, God is an impartial God. What have you done with Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? And all through the Scripture, the Old Testament included, you see God's mercy. You see God's inclusiveness. God's saying, you want to be part of my plan? I want you. I want you to be my child. Do you think that that same God today, if you were to say, God, I want to be your child, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior, what do you think He'd say to you? Yes. He'd say, yes, you can, and I want you. And more than that, I have a plan for your life. I'll use you. No matter what your background, no matter what your perspective, you have that attitude toward God. Later on, the Bible says in John 3, it says, He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. It doesn't take anything to come into condemnation. All it takes is just to ignore what God's done, ignore who God is. To see God as something or someone other than who He actually is and to not respond to His love. And all it takes to have eternal life is to call on the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now listen to me, it's so simple. That when I was four years old, I came to understand that I was a sinner. And I realized I was afraid of God. I was afraid of being of dying and being judged by God. But when I understood the simplicity of the gospel as a four year old, I was able to simply say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know Jesus died for my sins, and I want to be saved. I want to be your child because of what Jesus did. Is that a perfect prayer? I think God thought so. It's because all God wants is for you to call on Him. Say, I want you to be my God. I want you to be my Savior. You know, a lot of people have gotten saved with different prayers. Amen. Yeah. But every one of those prayers have been about Jesus and the work of the cross and receiving Him. And if you've never been saved before, today could be the day of salvation for you. Perhaps you've been looking to something like heritage or religion. And you thought that God was all about that, about you measuring up. If you actually thought that, you know what your conclusion would come be that you'd come to? Your conclusion actually would be, you know, I'm not sure I'm good enough for God. I'm not sure I'm, I'm religious enough based on what I think. And you know, you'd be right about that. Nobody would be good enough. Nobody would measure up. There's no one that's ever presented me with a system of religion that I have looked at and said, you followed your religion well enough that if that were the truth, now, there are people that try really hard, but they always fall short. Mm -hmm. True that. And that isn't what God cares about. He cares about a heart that says, I want to be part of God. I want God. I want His plan. I want Jesus. And you could be a Tamar. God, I want you. You could be a Rahab. God, I want you. And you know all of us are to some degree, aren't we? That doesn't save righteous people. God doesn't save good people. He saves sinners. I love what Paul said. Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, He saves wicked people and He saved me. He saved me. Has He saved you? Let's bow our heads for prayer. God, I thank You so much today for the truth that we've seen. That You're an impartial God who though You are righteous and holy and just, yet You are one who looks to sinners for anyone that would have a heart to say, I want Jesus, I want God to be my Father, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And God, I thank You so much for demonstrating mercy toward each of us. If you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a minute, I'd like to have a private conversation with everyone here and not have anyone look around and evade anyone else's privacy. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. The first question would be this. You're this morning and you'd say, you know, Pastor Price, I love the Bible, I love God, but I'm not sure that I have eternal life. I don't know that God is, that I've received the free gift of eternal life, and I'm a little bit concerned today about my eternal destiny. Don't call me out, don't embarrass me, but uh, pray for me, would you please, because I'm not sure about my eternal destiny. If that's you and you're here, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me about the matter of eternal life. I'm not sure that I know that God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior. Okay, here's a second question. You'd be here this morning and you say, Pastor, you know something? One of the things that's occurred to me from the Word of God today is that God is very impartial. 
He's not a respecter of persons. He's not impressed with people who think they're righteous, and he doesn't look down on people who are sinners. He's an impartial God who loves sinners. And you know, I, I've looked at God wrongly. I've looked at Him as a God who is more concerned with the things that people are concerned with. And God's shown me a truth about Him today, and I'm going to look at Him differently from now on. Would you pray for me that God will continue to show me the kind of an impartial God that He is? If that's you, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, God's helped me with this today. Would you pray for me? Yeah, just slip them up right back down. Right up and right down. Okay. Here's what we're going to do then. I'm going to finish our prayer, and while I finish the prayer, I'd like you to just tell God what you've told me. Now, God, I thank you so much for the truth of the Scripture and for the simplicity of it as it's been preached this morning. And I thank you that you're an impartial God who saves sinners, who's not a respecter of persons. Lord, I pray that Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, the body of believers here, would be known by you as a body that does not look at the things that man looks at and judge people that way. But God, that we would actually be a body of believers that knows that you see the heart and that we're first concerned with how you actually see us. Help us not to be satisfied with presenting ourselves to people in a way that would be the way we want to be seen or perceived. But help us instead, Father, to be concerned about how you actually see us. And then, Lord, help us to see other people the way that You do. Help us to see the potential that You have to save sinners. And not only just save sinners, but to use them. Lord, help us to be a church that integrates and implements people, gets them involved in serving You and in ministering to others. Because, God, You can use anybody. And help us to, help us to be able to help people be part of Your plan. Thank you for the decisions that have been made here today, and we ask that you would just increase the truth of it in our hearts and our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your great attention this morning. You're dismissed.